What I'd like to start with is uh, actually what I consider some of the less controversial aspects of immigration and, the, and illegal immigration. Because uh, I do think that there are problems associated with illegal immigration, and legal immigration for that matter, but most involve the intersection of public policy uh, and immigration, not the actual narrow economics of immigration per se. Uh, so the first is overall we find a net benefit to the U.S. economy from immigration. Uh, estimates vary, a conservative estimate by George Borjas, actually probably the most prominent economic critic of immigration, uh, he even puts the estimate, his latest one, is at at least $20 billion per year for the U.S. economy. Now, admittedly, that's modest as a proportion of the U.S. economy being a $13 trillion economy, but still significant and also disproportionate in some industries versus others. Uh, but also there's good reasons why the gain is not bigger. One clearly is our quantitative limitations on the, length, on the amount of immigrants who can come in. If more could come in, we could have bigger gains. Another is policies that distort which immigrants come in. So caps like H-1B visas that stop more skilled workers from coming in clearly hold us back. Other things that bias immigration towards family members versus other productive workers possibly hold us back. Uh, so the gains could be a lot bigger if immigration were more open. Uh, probably the biggest misconception, so I think actually among economists we talk about these things, economists do disagree about how to reform immigration clearly, but it's usually not over the general economic impacts of immigration. There's fairly wide consensus on that. But there seems to be a disjoint between what economists talk about and what the general public and politicians and policymakers say when they're debating this. And probably the biggest one is jobs. There seems to be a fear that if immigrants come here on net, they're going to take jobs away from the native-born population of the United States. And it's simply not true, and there's very little evidence for it. Uh, think about this. We don't have a fixed pie of a number of jobs in, in America. When we have more workers, we put more people to work doing more things. We have virtually limitless demands for goods and services. We get more workers, we make more things for ourselves. If it were actually true that we had a fixed number of jobs, we should already see massive unemployment in the US. Think just post-World War II. Massive entry of women into the workforce, baby boomers into the workforce, and post-1965 immigration flows. Where's the long-term unemployment? It's not there. The same is true when immigrants come in today. It may be true that they displace a particular American worker in a particular job at a point in time, but we re-employ them doing something else. This is what's happened when the women entered the workforce, when baby boomers en entered, and when previous immigrants entered. There's no fixed number of jobs here. Uh, so fears on this are completely unfounded. Those who would have you believe that the number of jobs, that the jobs on net are at risk, have to deal with this empirical regularity that we had massive entry into the workforce and no evidence of long-term structural unemployment increasing. Uh, and there's some good reasons for this, too, actually. We tend to think of just workers who are displaced here, but often, if it weren't for the immigrant coming in, the job would no longer exist here. Uh, for instance, and this actually happens both on the top end of the skill spectrum and on the bottom end, uh, in the garment industry, an industry that's been in decline in the United States, where largely we're starting to over, uh, outsource it overseas more and more, about a third of all garment workers in the U.S. are immigrants here. If that workforce weren't coming here, surely more garment jobs would have already been outsourced overseas. So just because the immigrant comes here doesn't mean they displace an American worker. It may be a job that would have disappeared if they hadn't come here. Similarly, on the high end of the spectrum, and this deals with the high skill end, I should say, this deals particularly with H-1B visas that limit skilled workers. Actually, this year it was a kind of particularly cruel April Fool's joke. There were 85,000 of these things up for grabs for a fiscal year that starts this November. And by the end of April 2nd, all 85,000 of these were already gone. Uh, Bill Gates, for one, has said, hey, I would outsource fewer jobs if I could bring more skilled workers here. Because I have a hard time bringing in highly skilled computer workers, I actually send more of my jobs overseas. This is yet another way that immigrants don't displace US workers. Now, some critics say, well, it, well actually, defenders of immigration often say, it's immigrants who come here and they do jobs that Americans won't do. And I think critics of immigration correctly respond, well, it's not that Americans won't do them. It's Americans won't do them for the wages that are offered. So surely, if you bid up the wages for agricultural work to $100 an hour, there's probably a lot of you who would leave this room right now to go back there and take a job. The question is, would the job exist if the wage had to get bid up to $100 an hour? And there's good evidence that they would not. In fact, we have examples of this. Uh, one example in last fall's lettuce crop in Arizona, actually, two-thirds of it didn't get harvested. They had problems bringing in laborers, migrants, to do the work. The farmers certainly could have bid up wages, but they chose not to. They left two-thirds of their crop in the ground to rot and took losses of a billion dollars. 
Now, the reason is, if they had bid the wages even higher to get the workers to harvest that other two-thirds of the crop, the revenue they would have got from selling the crop was even lower than the wages. So the jobs simply don't exist. That's another reason why they don't necessarily displace U.S. workers here, because the wage jobs simply wouldn't exist at a higher wage. Now, this raises another problem that often the public talks about. What about wages? When immigrants come here, does it depress the wages of American workers? Now, the joke kind of about economists, or there's plenty of these, but uh, one of them goes, an economist, as he goes through his career, learns more and more about less and less, so he knows absolutely everything about absolutely nothing. Uh, and to help remedy this, I mean, some of the journals get more and more hyper-specialized, so people who are experts in one field of economics weren't talking to people who are in another field. They created this Journal of Economic Perspectives, and what it's supposed to do is summarize general research findings in the different fields, and then communicate it to the other economists. Here was their conclusion when they examined immigration and the economic research on it. Quote, despite the popular belief that immigrants have a large adverse impact on the wages and employment opportunities of the native-born population, the literature on this question does not provide much support for the conclusion. We don't find evidence of the jobs disappearing, and we don't find that much evidence of the wages going down. Now, that article's a little bit outdated. There have been some studies done since, but still, the economists, when they find an effect on wages, it's very small and in only one area. Basically, when they examine directly high school dropouts who directly compete with immigrant labor that's unskilled that comes into this country. And there, the estimates vary. Uh, Borhaus, who's the critic, he has the highest estimate of this. He estimates that there's a negative 8% impact on the wages of high school dropouts when they can meet compete with immigrants who come to America. Other people actually still find zero effect or even slightly positive, but the range is basically slightly positive to negative 8% for high school dropouts only. In the other areas, we simply don't find it. Uh, now, this could be true, and it's actually to the extent it is, almost any economic policy that brings net benefits to the country, somebody doesn't benefit from, at least in the short term while they're adjusting. And that's what we're finding here, but I think it's important to think about this. This is high school dropouts in the US we're talking about, an increasingly small proportion of all US people. And I think the answer is not, therefore, we must keep even poorer immigrants out, but we need to do a better job of educating these people who didn't get a good education in the United States. Uh, so a question comes up, how is this possible? In fact, for those of you who have taken an economics course from my friends here at Metro State in the, in the economics department, uh, you've probably learned that the economists, at least in the principles course, seem to worship that supply and demand. That how is it possible that the supply of labor increases, immigrants come here, yet it doesn't push down our wages? In fact, I was accused of violating the laws of supply and demand when I wrote a popular column on immigration. And actually, I'm sure if there's one point of agreement for us today, it will be that whenever you write something on immigration, you get more hate mail than almost any other issue that you write on. Uh, it's at least certainly true for me. Uh, and this particular one generated a slew, and one was just an ad hominem attack, and I usually just delete these things, but I had had a few cocktails that night when I got home. So I decided I would respond, and uh, we had an exchange that actually got more civil as it went on, and he was essentially accusing me of ignoring the laws of supply and demand. If you have a greater number of workers to go around, it's got to push down the wages of those workers. And I was pointing out the parts of economic theory that say what the exceptions are to this, mainly not all else is constant. And uh, he decided he wanted to run a column. He runs a website, I guess, that's dedicated to immigration issues. And he said, would you mind if I put our entire exchange on there? And uh, I had to kind of poof myself and make sure I didn't say anything too outlandish. But uh, I agreed to. And uh, to my knowledge, actually, it's the only time I've ever appeared on a neo-Nazi website. Uh, but it, it was an attack job, so I guess I don't feel bad about it. Uh, he changed the title, though. He told me that the title was going to be Economist Denies the Law of Supply and Demand, which I thought rather odd. Uh, but actually, after he read the stuff that I sent him, he decided to change the title and it was Economics Profession Denies the Laws of Supply and Demand. Uh, so what are we getting at here? How? Well, first of all, there's a question, is there a such thing as, quote, the supply of labor? Or are different units of labor have different characteristics that make them better at one thing versus another? It's certainly clear that labor is not homogeneous. There's differences between workers. So instead of just substituting for American labor, they can complement American labor, basically by bringing skills that Americans don't have so much. In fact, if you want to think about it, think of the spectrum of skilled workers in the US economy. There's a very small percentage that are up at the top of the skill pyramid, a very small percentage that are high school dropouts. The vast majority of Americans are pretty well educated and have a lot of skills. If we were going to put a picture to it, it would look kind of like a diamond. A few people at the top, a few people at the bottom, real fat in the middle. Think about the immigrant population that comes here. What does that look like? Exactly the opposite. There's a high percentage of highly skilled immigrants who come here, and a high percentage of very low skilled immigrants who come here. And there's probably good reasons why. 
at the lowest end of the spectrum. These are the people who are most desperately poor in their own home countries and need to do anything they can to get by and support their families, and they'll take great risks to come here. At the very top end, there are people who might be better informed about opportunities and maybe have the most uh, overall economic gains from coming here when they move from a poor institutional environment to a better one here in the United States. Uh, the middle class does move here, but just not as great a proportions as the other two. And this actually bears it out when we look at the data in America. Uh, across the country, native-born population makes, only, makes up only about one-third out of those who are high school dropouts here in the country. Two-thirds are immigrants who come in. Similarly, when you look at those who hold PhDs, only 28% of Americans, or 28% of people with PhDs in the United States were native-born. Over 70% were born overseas. What's this telling us is, the immigrants who are coming here tend not to be substitutes for American labor. They tend to be what we call complements. They possess skills that we don't, which frees us up to do other things that we're better skilled at. If you think about a low-skilled immigrant, what do they add to the economy when they come here? And you say, look, they're only doing this little task that doesn't add very much value. Well, you have to say, well, would that task get done anyway? And does it free up an American worker to do something that they're more productive at then? Uh, a personal example, actually, uh, I live in Boston now, but the last four years I lived in California. Uh, with real estate prices there, I had a backyard like maybe one eighth the size of the stage. Uh, but it was all sloped and nasty. The trees were pressed up against the house. I wanted taken care of. I had one estimate for about $10,000. I said, no way. I had another one for about five. I said, well, maybe, I wasn't sure, maybe I'd do it myself. As it turns out, I'd probably still be digging if I had tried. Uh, I was overestimating, underestimating how much those to be done. Uh, but at the same time, a consulting project came through for me at the same week. And it was gonna pay me more than it was gonna cost to have my backyard done. I said, well, I could spend about a week doing the backyard, or I could spend a week writing this consulting paper. By having immigrant labor here who could do the backyard, it freed me up to write a consulting paper that otherwise would have never come into existence. Or, and so this, on net, society is richer, or at least I hope it's richer, by one policy paper that would have otherwise not existed. And it only existed because the immigrant labor was there to free me up. Similarly, if you have a doctor, a real doctor, you know, a medical doctor, who's doing, who's doing uh, you know, operations and brain surgery, is his time best spent mowing his lawn? Or would it be better if he could outsource that, or for that matter, his cleaning and other things, and have an immigrant provide that for him so he can spend more time in the operating room? Basically, the cost of him doing those tasks for himself are the other high productivity tasks he could be doing. So when we have immigrants come in that free up American labor for this, this makes us overall more productive. In fact, this is where we're getting our net gains from immigration from. It's not just the services they provide here, but it's the shift that they allow the US labor market to do, to do those things that we're better suited to. This was Adam Smith's insight over 200 years ago in The Wealth of Nations, and specialization and the division of labor, basically specializing in what we're best at, is limited by the extent of the market, how many people we can integrate with. Now, usually economists talk about this in the context of world trade, but it's also true in the context of immigration. We're bringing the market here. By its nature, particular goods and services have to be done on site. Foreign trade is not a substitute for immigration. Now, the actually laws governing them in terms of economics are relatively similar, which is why economics find most of the stuff I've said fairly uncontroversial so far. Uh, in fact, actually there's good evidence from this, by the way, about complementarity just from Colorado. I was reading a couple things about Colorado on my way here. Uh, a nice local example, Arapaho uh, Acres uh, Nursery, they have a, uh, a business that installs large trees. And there they have one US born uh, foreman for a job and he has to have two H2B visa people working to install the tree with him. And they said, well, listen, if we didn't have the migrants coming here with the H2B visas, the job for the foreman wouldn't exist. This is a clear example of immigrants coming here and complementing the skills of a US worker that's here, not substituting for him. Another economic area of this, how am I doing for time? Just, just good? <laughs> Eight minutes, fantastic. Uh, another area of economics on this. And this doesn't, so far I've talked about net benefits to the American population versus to the immigrants themselves. But clearly we care about the benefits to the immigrants. In fact, we care about the third world in general. Uh, the reality is 50 years of official development policy of aid for the third world has been an abysmal failure. Sub-Saharan Africa since independence has a negative per capita growth rate. That's not growing slowly, that's getting poorer. We've done a very poor job with these programs. Uh, immigration is a form of foreign aid that actually works pretty effectively. The most obvious way it works is when the immigrant leaves their country that has bad rules and comes here and is able to get a huge boost in their income working in a more productive environment. It, in a sense, this is economic development. I mean, no one, we, we don't really care that the land where Zimbabwe is is poor. We care about the people who are there that are trapped in poverty. I mean, no one goes around wringing their hands saying, where is the GDP for Antarctica? 
just penguins down there, who cares? We care about the people, so they move here and that's a form of economic development, but it's also a form of economic development back where they came from, because the immigrants send remittances back there. Remittances where they're familiar with the particulars, the context of local culture, time and place there. They know which family members and friends to send to. They get feedback from other friends and family members in the area telling them how well it's being used or if it's just their brother-in-law stealing it to drink. These things get feedback, actually. When we do official development aid, we work through our own bureaucracies here in the United States to our international bureaucracies to the third world corrupt governments in these countries. In fact, USA Today published a list of the 20 worst dictators in the world last year. Uh, 19 of the 20 re receive official development aid from the United States, and 20 of 20 got it from OECD countries. This is not an effective way to do foreign aid. Remittance is actually more successful with this. Although I don't want to overplay it, they're not a panacea. The real problem in the third world is bad governance, bad institutions, bad rules. Until they get those right, they're not going to develop. This is at least something in the short term that is somewhat positive, unlike most of our foreign aid programs of the past. What I've said so far isn't that controversial with economists. They might hold different views on whether we should have bigger or smaller amounts of immigration, but the economic facts aren't so, so disputed, at least not in the way that they are in the policy and popular realm. Uh, in fact, the Independent Institute, where I was, where I guess I still am a research fellow with, we published an open letter on immigration that said largely these same things. And we circulated quickly 500 economists signed it in all 50 states and across the political spectrum. It doesn't break down ideologically when you look at economists. Uh, in fact, we had Brad Duong, a famous economist who's, who's called for George Bush's impeachment, and we had Greg Bankew, the former chair, uh, chief economic advisor on the Council of Economic Advisors to Bush sign it. So it doesn't break down the way it tends to in the, in the popular debate. Uh, so kind of the joke about economists, or another one of them is, you know, what president he asked for, I just once I want a one-armed economist so he can't say on the one hand this, on the other that. <laughs> the stuff about jobs, wages, net gains for our economy, not that controversial. What is more controversial is how to reform it, what to do with the people who are here, what to do with public services, which are separate from the economy. So note two things in my talk I have done thus far, actually that I'm sure my debate partner will know. So far I've talked about immigration generally, not just illegal immigration. But there's a good reason for this. If we get net benefits from the immigration, that's pointing towards the solution for the problems that come from illegal immigration. Make them legal. Not just the ones who are here, but the ones who want to come here. Open up greater legal avenues for them to come in so that we can get these net benefits. The other thing that I haven't talked about so far, which I don't consider an economic problem, are fiscal effects. So it's clearly true that there are particular jurisdictions, especially at the local level, where when immigrants, legal or illegal, come into the area, they spill over costs on others. By spill over costs on others, I mean to consume social services that cost other taxpayers money. Often, the tax revenue that immigrants, legal or illegal, generate tends to go towards the federal government while a lot of the revenue that they receive or the services they receive are financed locally. That can make a fiscal drain on a local community. A solution to this wouldn't be to just cut off immigration, it would be reform our tax and spending policies. Either where the services are delivered from or where they're financed from, or also seriously considering what is it that causes these spillover costs. Basically, when people have to interact on a voluntary basis, I have to come here, I have to bid to get you to rent me the property, you have to bid to get me to work for you, that's when we get overall net gains for each other. When all of a sudden I can come in and without your permission I'm entitled to some of your tax dollars, that's a spillover cost. And that doesn't lead to efficient decision making necessarily. Now that's true whether you're foreign born or native born. So this points to some weaknesses in some of our, uh, just four minutes, uh, in some of the ways that we deliver social services here. So it actually leads to inefficient migration, not just between Mexico and the US, but between Colorado and California, Colorado and Kansas, wherever else. Uh, so we might want to consider how we address these problems. I think this is where actually good debate should be. And hopefully we'll get to more of this in the Q&A, is talking about how do we reform public policies so that we don't have these negative consequences. But also note, because we find an overall get net gain of at least 20 billion to the economy from the immigrants who come here, that's net to the existing Americans that are born here. That tells you to the extent that you find costs in public policy, the overall wealth creation that happens because they come here can cover it. It's just we're not matching the benefits that they provide to the services that they consume efficiently. That's the game that we have to play. Uh, not just putting a blanket restriction on it, immigration. Basically, the amount they enlarge our pie more than covers their services. So we need to address what services they can get and for how much and where. Uh, Just touching on another problem 
then. Uh, crime and terrorism certainly come up. Uh, I think concerns about immigrants coming here to do terrorism are valid. We should be concerned about this. But we also need to realize how bad a job we're doing right now screening them. When you have a million and a half illegal border crossing attempts on the Mexican border every year, you're not doing a very good job of sorting out legitimate workers from would-be terrorists. If you opened up much greater avenues to legal immigration so you could check them that they're not on a known watch list when they come into the US, there'd be many fewer people crossing in the desert, and it'd be much easier to detect who they are. Uh, so I think while more needs to be said about that, uh, I think our current system where we have lots of people who want to come here illegally uh, does a really poor job of it for that matter. When we talk about guest worker programs, the numbers that they talk about are far too small. Uh, far too small first for our own economic benefits, but also to solve any problems associated with illegal immigration. Because the guest worker program started at around 500,000, they've been whittled down to around 200,000, and even that's politically dead right now. But we have a million and a half attempts on the Mexican border every year to cross illegally. If you put in a small guest worker program, you still have the same immigration problem you had before. Uh, so with that, I guess I'd like to close and uh, welcome debate and comments on this. I think what I'd really like to see is if we're going to make claims about jobs, you have to deal with the counterfactual. It's not just immigrants. When we added more bodies to the economy, your jobs didn't disappear. That's a fact that needs to be dealt with if you want to claim it's bad for jobs. If you want to claim it's bad for wages, you have to talk about why they're substitutes, not complements, and why basically economists don't find it anywhere except in the low-skilled laborers where they tend to be uh, to some, a greater extent, substitutes for a particular segment of American workers. If you can't deal with those two points, you're not on good ground for arguing that it's bad for American workers when they come here. If the argument becomes there's a fiscal drain on America because of it, I think there's actually conflicting evidence on this. National Academy of Sciences found that over an immigrants' lifetime, they pay more in taxes than they consume in social services. Other studies have found the opposite. I think there's room for debate on this, but regardless of what your answer on the current empirics is, it should be, OK, well, let's address our social services policy so that this is not the case if, in fact, there was a negative drain on it. And I'd be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. So thank you all, and I look forward to more discussion. I've really spent most of my political life trying to describe the new world we're moving into. You know, politics is like surfing, as the old metaphor goes. And you look over the, your shoulder and see where the waves are coming. And I have been really trying to think about the implication of what, what happens if, as we're on this road to do, there would be a billion people in the United States that we're leaving for our grandchildren. Is that the kind of America you want to leave to your grandchildren? Folks, our globe is warming. Our oceans are warming. Our ground tables are um, shrinking. Our ice caps are melting. Nature's trying to tell us something. And what it's trying to tell us is the world of endless economic growth and endless population growth is over. Do you want to have a future for your kids? Do you want to have a future for your grandkids? We've really got to think about the fact that adding more people and more GDP is not the, that cannot be the end of the discussion. We are, I think we are absolutely in a fight for our species survival. Not only I think that, but literally, you know, you take the Royal Academy, you take the National Academy of Sciences, they're signaling us, folks. They're saying we're in trouble. And we've got to rethink the economist's view of the world, where just more GDP, boy, that's a good thing. I'm interested not in adding more GDP. I'm interested in adding more per capita GDP. Now some of you will say that's being inconsistent, and you may be right. You really may be right. But nevertheless, I really don't want to add GDP. I want to try to lift up the per capita, per capita GDP in America. That's vastly different than increasing the GDP. But to say we add $20 billion, immigration advantages, $20 billion dollars to our economy in a 13 trillion dollar economy that isn't that is de minimis so what are the other issues folks who are no longer when the statue of liberty was built there were 79 million americans here it was an empty continent of 
course we needed more different people. But do you really think if we have, we're headed right now toward shortly after the middle part of this century to have a half a billion Americans, and then by the end of the century, this is under current, this isn't talking about the, the, the dramatic increases that some people are talking about. Then by the end of this century, there'd be a billion. Well, I figure, you know, there's a billion Americans. That'll be about 16 million Coloradoans. Well, how would you handle 16 million Coloradoans? You can go 100 miles from where we're having lunch, 100 miles, and you can see the wagon wheels of the Oregon Trail snaking off there across the desert, laid down in the 1840s, and you can still see them. Now, is that the kind of, you think that, you want 16 million Coloradoans living in a semi-arid climate? We've got to rethink things. This is not the world we want to leave to our children and our grandchildren. First time I came across the question of illegal immigration, a bunch of Hispanic Americans came into my office. They had worked for a packing plant and they'd just been fired. Just been fired and replaced by a bunch of illegal immigrants. And these guys came into my office and they said, what the hell? You know, we're, we're, we're Americans and they just replaced us. This was a hell of a deal for the owner of the packing plant. Was, was paying like uh, $8 an hour this back, this is 1976, was paying $8 an hour plus health benefits, fired them, hired a bunch of illegal immigrants for $4.50 an hour, no health benefits. Of course, it affects the employer, of course, good deal for the employer. But how about our own people? How about our own people? How about people that be at the lower end of things? Now, I think that the people that literally that have looked at this so let's, let's, let's say who's formally looked at it. There's been two presidents that have appointed commissions, or Congress. The first was one of the great liberals of our time, my time anyway, Father Hesper. He ran the first immigration commission. What did they find? Stop illegal immigration. It is important to our own poor and to the, 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 the whole fabric of our society and to our taxpayers to stop illegal immigration. So then Governor, uh, President Clinton said, What's the, let's have a commission on immigration. And he headed, Bar he asked Barbara Jordan, the black congresswoman from uh, Houston, to head that commission. What did they find? Stop illegal immigration and cut legal immigration in half. That's essentially what they found. And, the, and they, they, they looked at this problem and they said, look, Illegal immigration is, uh, is a danger to the fabric of America because we've got to raise our own pool. It's just the same thing that I saw when these people came into my office. And I've watched this over the years when I was in office. It wasn't only packing plants, but it would be, originally there would be um, illegals to come in and dig, dig ditches, and then they would do the flooring, and then they'd do the siding, and then they'd do the roofing. And then all of a sudden you couldn't hire a supervisor unless they spoke Spanish too. And all of a sudden, there is this great replacement. There's not a replacement. Let's see who's been convinced about this. Paul Krugman, one of the leading economists in the uh, United States, and the columnist said, says this, um, unfortunately, low-skilled immigrants don't pay enough taxes to cover the benefits that they receive. Um, America, if it's going to keep its safety net, we should look at the question of low-skilled immigration. How about Nicholas Kristof, the liberal um, writer um, in the New York, in the, in the syndicated columnist. I've changed my mind on a guest worker program because of the glow, growing evidence that low-wage immigration hurts America's own poor. The cold reality is that admitting poor immigrants often mean, means hurting poor Americans. How about um, Morton Zuckerman, the editor-in-chief of U.S. News and World Report? So why haven't overall poverty rates declined further? In a word, immigration, end quote. My second argument is what it does to our taxpayers. Um, the, the key to illegal immigration is what used to be single people coming up from south of our border, working and going home. Now whole families are arriving. 
And so that when you, when you look at the various studies on what does an illegal immigrant make, um, the average is in that there's two different studies. One came out at $15,000 a year, the other at $22,000 a year. I think the Pew Hispanic Center says it's $22,000 a year. You know, you, when you have a family, there is $22,000. You, know, you, don't, you don't pay your own way. Um, you're subsidized by the taxpayers. I don't mind doing that, but I can't do it for the world. You know, there's five billion people out there that live at a level, level of living below that of Mexico's standard of living. There's, a, there's three billion that live on uh, two or three dollars a day. And so the question that we're having is, you know, if, if you really want liberal programs, liberal programs demand borders. I can't get, I can't give everybody, I've been fighting all my life for universal health care. You think I can give universal health care and give it to everybody in the world? You've got to have borders. You want to keep Social Security, you want to keep a safety net, you've got to have borders. And borders means you have to, you have to in fact, control people that, that come here. I can show you houses, no, I can't show you anymore, but I could at one time, um, that were, there would be two families living together. Um, at the time, there were probably um, maybe, maybe $10,000 a year, each family living in the same, in the same house had 11 kids in our school system. Well, today's terms, it costs us about $7,800 to educate a school child. We, we, you know, this isn't cheap labor, this is subsidized labor. You're asking you know, the other taxpayers, many of them close to the line themselves, to in fact subsidize this institution of illegal immigration. Why? Why? So some employer can get cheap labor? and prevent our own people from coming up. My argument is that a tight labor market is the best friend that a poor can have. You want to get our employers to go into the ghettos and barrios of America and train our own people and get them jobs, have a tight labor market. Let me end with my last point, and that's a matter of national security. You know, it used to be that if you wanted to do harm to America, you had to have an army that could beat our army and a navy to get you here. That's no longer the world we live in. You see on 9-11 what kind of, um, what, what 19 people can do to uh, our, our country. So the 9-11 Commission, what's the 9-11 Commission? Says we have to have a counterfeit proof ID. I would argue that before you get a job, before you get on an airplane, or before you open up a bank account, you should, should prove you, uh, that you're legal in the United States. Whether you call that a national ID card or not, I don't know. But I think that you, we have to understand that there's a second new world, not only this new environmental world, but there's this new world of national security. There's hundreds of millions of people, as we talk, that are being taught in madrasas all over the Islamic world to kill the great Satan and do harm to America. We have to know who's in the United States, and we have to make sure that we stop this Swiss cheese border attitude. The 9-11 the hijackers have 63 fake driver's licenses. So for reasons of national security, for reasons of the taxpayer, but most of all, for reasons of our own poor, we have to stop the legal immigration. Thank you. of disagreement on this issue is the impact of ending illegal immigration and the impact that it would have on our economy, either positive or negative. Assuming it would be possible to stop the flow of illegal immigration, could you discuss what the impact would be on the economy as a whole and specifically the cost to American consumers of commodities and services? And, uh, pardon me? <laughs> you can go back and forth. Am I still on? There we go. Um, so, obviously the gains that we get from immigration right now would be the first things to go, or at least partially if we close the borders more. Uh, it also depends what we talk about doing with the existing illegal immigrants that are in the United States now. Often people talk about moving them out. So assuming that's possible and putting up a stronger border, uh, one, we're gonna have a severe short-term shock to our economy because they're not just evenly distributed. It's not just 20 billion in a $13 trillion economy that's clustered in particular industries. So it's estimated right now that about 24% of all farm jobs, 17% of all cleaning jobs, 
27% of them all butchery jobs, a large number of construction jobs. Immigrants tend to cluster in these industries. If we clamp down on illegal immigration and move the ones out who are here in those industries now, that's where you're going to see the biggest effects, both in terms of uh, losses for U.S. businesses that currently employ them and work in them, and also that's where you're also going to see the increase in prices for American consumers and, and quite frankly, the lack of ability of, or lack of supply of some goods that Americans demand. Uh, on another note, since I only used two minutes to answer that, I'd just like to say about this per capita G key thing, I agree completely what we care about is that, not just a bigger pie, we probably care about a bigger slice of the pie for everybody who's here. Uh, but economy, in fact, that's what I was talking about when I was talking about the 20 billion, that's two existing Americans, so divide by 300 million people and there you got your per capita gain from immigration. Uh, but this notion that there's these other things that we're running out of, and if they come to America, we're gonna run out, this is nothing new. Economists have heard this objection for centuries with Thomas Malthus being the first and foremost among them, but we hear it again and again, that the evidence, whenever we look to see what is it that we're running out of, that they said we were going to, they're wrong. And what are they missing? The greatest resource, or what Julian Simon called the ultimate resource, human ingenuity. Why is it that we have the standard of living and the goods and services that we do? It's because of the creative ways humans have cooperated, innovated, created new technologies and capital to give us these things, and they end up economizing on those resources that become more scarce. This is why Julian Simon had a famous bet 20 years ago with an environmentalist who made exactly this claim. He said, name 10 resources that we're running out of. If we're really running out of them, the price should be higher 10 years from now. They made the bet. He was right, the other guy was wrong, they weren't running out of it, they made the same bet again, and he was right again. Basically, human ingenuity trumps this, that's why I'm not particularly concerned about an increased population. With the slight asterisk that if you're in an area where there's common property and you can spill over costs to others, then you can have negative consequences. So think of some common grazing lands in Africa or something like that, where actually increased population growth rates ends up depleting resources because you don't bear the cost of your actions. Uh, you can spill over the grazing onto other people. That's a concern. So to the extent that we have those type of problems, which are much less severe here in America than other parts of the world, uh, that's what we should be worrying about. And in fact, to the extent we have, since we have less of them here in America, we'd be better off from a global environmental standpoint if more of the poor in the world had actually moved to America instead of staying where they are, where they can spill over more of the cost on others. And, uh, Um, I do think that there has to be going to be some adjustment in our economy and in our structure of business. I think that um, a lot of that would be positive, as I mentioned before, and I don't want to repeat. But you, you ask, for instance, I mean, it's often said you want to pay five dollars a head for uh, a head of lettuce. Um, so I looked up the, late, the latest study that I could find anyway. But the average family paid fifty-two hundred dollars in food in the year two thousand. Uh, $322 of that was spent on fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so, uh, you know, most of the cost of almost anything we buy in a grocery store is not the people who pick it. You can double their wages and you're, but you're not going to find much increase in the price of uh, any of this stuff. It's the middlemen that's all, all the, that is the problem. So I would really argue that it is not a problem in terms of the foodstuffs. Um, but to the extent that it is, and I do believe that there is a need for certain um, labor to pick, up, to pick Colorado's peaches and to harvest them, that we should do it on a guest worker program. Because I think that there are really lots of people that would like to come to the United States. They don't want to necessarily move here, but they would like to come as guest workers, earn money that they can send home. So I would think that, the, that, that, that that's not the end of the argument. My main argument really is that um, there's a that we have to rethink this very idea of immigration. There's five billion people out there. How many of them do you want? There's six billion people out there, but how many of them do you want and do you think can live satisfied lives in our country? Okay, some have proposed creating a new migrant worker visa for undocumented immigrants. This would be subject, although obviously they would not be undocumented if they earn this visa, they would be subject to US labor laws and pay federal, state, and local taxes in one form or another. Instead of pay, paying Social Security and Medicaid, the new visa would pay the same amount into an immigrant health fund. Governor Lane, why don't you take this one first? Well, who's going to pay for educating the kids? Are they going to be able to bring their kids? Are they going to be able to bring their families? Who's going to pay for the education of their kids? Who's going to pay for their health care? Cheap labor is economic cocaine to our employers. They love the econ cheap labor. They'll do anything. They don't care about you. They don't care about our poor people. They'll do anything for to get cheap labor. And so I'm very suspicious about this kind of thing. But yes, I do believe some of it is necessary, but I think there ought to be controlled guest workers coming in and then leaving. Well, 
Well, uh, I guess we agree that I'm a little bit skeptical of it too, but probably for different reasons. I find the government's pretty bad at managing most pro programs in our economy, and I think this wouldn't be an exception. Uh, I'd much rather just let the workers come here and work and actually address the ways that we currently do what you call subsidized labor now. And I, I guess I'd agree in a sense that it is subsidized labor that they can consume social services such as health care and education and other things for their families when they come here. Part of that, though, and the bringing their family with them is related to the fact that it's hard to go back and forth across the border now. I think with a more open immigration policy, you'd have much more like what happened in the past where a lot of the men came here and worked in the fields and then would migrate back home and come seasonally back and forth on their own. In fact, when you look at 19th century immigration to the United States, almost a third of the people who came here ended up going back to their home country afterwards. But when we have a closed border policy or the type of border policy that we have now, it makes it much harder to go back and forth. So they come here and they stay and they try to bring in their families, which actually makes this kind of subsidized problem worse. But what's your, how many people do you think we ought to let in the year? Should there be borders? Unlike you, I don't know the answer to this question. No more than I know the answer to the number of people who should move like I did from California to Boston. How do we find out within our country? We have competitive labor markets where employers bid for you to come there or to stay where you are, and you have to pay the cost of your housing, food, room and board, and et cetera, and you weigh the offers, and then you decide where you should be. Now, it is true that in the United States, we have subsidized labor here, too, because we consume these very social services that immigrants are accused of using. So we don't have a perfect flow of immigrants between California, Boston, Colorado, Nebraska, or anywhere else. But we're a lot closer to it than we are with our national policy. In fact, we don't know the correct quantity of labor to move between any two jurisdictions. It's labor as a market. We don't know how to centrally plan that any better than the Soviets knew how to centrally plan shoe production. Folks, that is, the, that is the race to the bottom of the ultimate thing. That let the labor market decide, again. That so, in other words, Bangladesh and the poor people in wherever it is in the world, we're gonna set our labor market, and we're allowed to come here and compete for our jobs. There's hardly a job in this room that is safe if you're gonna go in that thing. You can, you can find uh, Indians that speak English just as well as we do and can teach our courses and can run, run our television sets and everything else. Don't go down this road. Oh. You're selling out the poor people in America. Okay, then confront the evidence I cited earlier. When we have more people here, jobs don't on net disappear. We create more jobs, and we don't find evidence of the wages going down. I, I think you do find the wages. You cited them yourself. The, why is it that the top one-tenth of one percent get so much money, and the lower 20 percent have, have lost uh, status in the United States, and the poorest people, one up with uh, uh, high school education, have lost 8.2 percent. That's your figure, not mine. I think that you're, I think that the I stated Pat that the best way to help our own poor is not to have them compete with people who want to come in here from Bangladesh, but to control our borders. So do I correctly interpret you as now saying that the only people who lose wage wise from immigrants coming to America are high school dropouts, and the biggest effect is about 8 percent? That's the one that I'm most worried about. Okay, unless, is there someone who's ready from the audience to ask a question? If not, I have another one. Okay, I think folks are ready to go. Hey, Dr. Powell, Kirk Monaghan says we're moving to a two-tier society, the gods and the clouds. You bet that's the one I'm most worried about. I think that we've got, we are facing a divisiveness in this society um, because of the lower, because we're not doing better by the lower people in this, the lower status in this society. And those are the ones that I think we have to, Help. Actually, this is taking a very static view of it, though. You mentioned poverty hasn't declined more because of immigration. Clearly, people who migrate here are poorer than most Americans. That means they bump up the poverty statistics. But that's a snapshot in time. Look what happens over time. We actually have tremendous income mobility from the bottom quintile to the top quintile over a 20-year period. Okay. Clearly, there's a lot of interest out there, so we'll take our first question from the audience. <clears throat> yes, my question is for uh, Governor Lamb. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering, when are you going to finally stop using disparaging and insulting words to describe people who come here seeking jobs, people who have been invited here for, for many, many years, and who don't deserve the kind of label that you put on them? As I recall, uh, when I first moved to Colorado, I voted for you three times. Shortly thereafter, because uh, of my advancing age, you, your suggestion was that uh, people like me kill ourselves because there are too many seniors. You, uh, you got the label government balloon, and uh, maybe that's a little harsh, but it appears to me that 
few years ago, you wanted seniors to off themselves. Now you want immigrants to start themselves. Is there no end to your joviality? Yeah. I, I just, and seriously, I, I would suggest to everyone, stop using these disparaging words. These are undocumented people. If there is any illegality, then the U.S. government certainly is an accomplice because we have invited these people for over half a century, starting with the Bracero program and <clears throat> the Tuli. I, I have a, a question about <clears throat> which, which involves economics. Um, and, and by the way, for those who wonder, I am a student here. Uh, I'm called a, an outlier, okay? Because I don't uh, fit in with the... With the uh, Sir, just ask economy. your question. Okay, my question is, economically, the white population, the dominant population that is so fearful of losing control, uh, which this is all, uh, this whole subject is about anyway, if the white population is declining, and we are not going to be able to sustain our economy, who's going to pay my Social Security? Aren't we better off? Are we not better off inviting people, good people to come here, train them, educate them, give them skills, allow them to become... Uh, okay, I got your question. Allow them to become part of our economy that will then aid our entire country, as so many immigrant ways have done in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Let me explain to the audience, though I suspect everybody knows. Um, you know, I was at a health conference uh, here, and, 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 and somebody used the word right to die. And I said in response, we don't have a right to die. Um, we have a duty to die. As Shakespeare said, we all owe God a death. But the point I was making is that we are all mortal. The mortality rate is 100%. So the Denver Post ran a, 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 a column the next day, front page. Governor Lamb says the elderly and the terminally ill have a duty to die. Luckily, we had a recording of it. Luckily, that all the way from the New York Times to everybody else corrected it, but it's always a good cheap shot to use against me. I would say the same thing. The bringing in people from a less than we're going to take immigrants, I believe we ought to take them for the skills that they bring to us. And that's why I support the Barbara Jordan viewpoint. We should, in fact, go to the skills. They, they can be from Mexico, they can be from wherever, but we should try to bring the skills in that, uh, that, that make us richer and can afford to do this. But that bringing in somebody with less than a high school, uh, an average illegal immigrant has 7.6 years of education. They're number one, a drain on our taxes, and number two, they're not really going to contribute to your Social Security. The problem with this type of reasoning on it is actually, one, how do we know which skills, as planners, all the businesses in the country need? I'm not up to it, I don't know any ministry that is. Uh, but then, this notion about the Social Security and the taxes for that matter, that an illegal immigrant or for that matter just a low skilled immigrant pays, it's misleading because while they might not pay it themselves, it is true that there's jobs that does not require that do not require high skill sets that have to get done. And if existing Americans have to do them because there are no low skilled immigrants here, well, that's going to take away from the productivity of the other Americans, which means we contribute less to Social Security and give less services to everybody else. So just because the low-skill immigrant only provides a small service, it doesn't mean that he doesn't free up other American workers to provide bigger services. In fact, this is the whole notion of comparative advantage and specialization that Adam Smith talks about and why we find the net gain from immigration in America. You can go out to any work site around the Denver metropolitan area and you find people paid in cash. We don't get it. Forty percent, we figure, of the illegal immigrants are paid off books. We get no, we get no Social Security taxes. We get no federal um, taxes in it, and a lot of the rest of them that even pay have learned to claim to a ten or twelve uh, exemptions. So we still get very little federal income tax from them. It is true they pay Social Security. Actually, this isn't true uh, because we created the individual taxpayer identification number in 1996. It's collected over 50 billion dollars from mostly illegals since it was created. But also. 
if, let's just assume, for the sake of argument, that they pay zero in taxes because they all get paid in cash. Well, there's an employer who employs them, and apparently by paying in cash in the uh, black labor market for them, he makes greater profits. Well, if he makes greater profits, he pays bigger taxes. That puts more into the system. No, the immigrant himself didn't literally pay it, but by him being here, somebody put it in. Folks, there you got it. There you got it. It's the George Bush School of Economics. Give the tax breaks to the rich. Let the rich make a lot of money, and it'll trickle down. No, no, no. This is not the last I'm saying what you said. The last person I want to learn any economics from is any politician. But. <laughs> audience, since there are so many people who want to ask questions, to please, your time at the mic, please use it to ask a quick question. Go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, having had a child molested, I learned something about boundaries. And as a biologist, I know that the way that your blood cells, white blood cells kill an invader, is first they tag it, then they do about 20 things because everything's uh, biology world, and then they do a cellular knife and cut the cell in half. It has no boundary, that's the end of it. So I'm, you can guess how I feel about Bush and his total refusal to enforce any law about boundaries. Our discussion about who we should let in and who we shouldn't, it doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter what I think, it doesn't matter what anybody in here thinks because we don't have lawyers right now. And I, I, I surely agree with you, uh, uh, Mr. Lamb, that we certainly should. What is your but question? As I see the primary issue, it takes us 12 years to process a legal immigrant. That is third world. Anywhere you have something taking more than several months for the government to do its job, you get the situation of why capitalism works in the West and fails everywhere else. You don't have a government if it can't get something done in an awful lot less time than 12 years. You have pointed out, sir, I uh, forgot your name, that uh, we definitely need more legal immigration. Well, why doesn't somebody point out that we don't have any legal immigration right now? I see that as an issue that until we solve that, we're going to have nothing but illegals. We're going to have the child molestation that they cause, the destruction of our stuff. Okay. Talking All right. About I think we're talking about no control. I think there was a question. Because the honest ones should okay. be here. Okay. We're going to give them a chance to respond. Go ahead. I think your question was about, is there not enough legal immigration? We're going to have illegals and all the problems this illegality itself causes, including the vast majority of our honest okay. and good jobs, and should be here. I would love to see 16 million Coloradans, and I want them legal. No, actually, I could find a lot of agreement and sense in what was said there. Uh, you're you're going to expect that I'm going to react against it, but actually, I think she brings up a valid point about borders. Uh, and for that matter, wanting immigration to be legal and not illegal, because there are negative consequences of it being illegal versus legal. That's why my answer is open up much bigger legal avenues so that we don't have such an illegal problem. But the other thing about borders, I think it's important. We all draw borders in our life. You have a fence around your property properly. It uh, markets what's yours versus what somebody else's and what they can trample on. Borders are important, but we have to distinguish those from lines politicians draw on maps. And right now, there's people who live along the Mexican border who have their borders, their property borders, violated by those who are trying to skirt around U.S. immigration laws, who come across, trespass on their property, commit vandalism, leave the people in fear of some of the negative things that this woman has pointed out. And these are legitimate concerns. But I actually think the best way to address them is opening up greater legal avenues so people don't have to cut through the desert and over people's property to get here. Let me talk about this question of 16 million Coloradans. The most terrifying day I spent in office was looking at our tree ring laboratory up at CSU, which shows the drug patterns in this area that we live. You know, why did the Anasazi move away about the time of Columbus? Because we had a 30-year drought. There's seven droughts on that tree ring laboratory that in fact were um, almost of that magnitude, 15 to 30 years. You know, we've been living in a relatively um, uh, wet cycle, but you do not want 16 million Coloradans. We don't have enough water. We don't want, you really want a strip city from, you know, from, from Fort Collins to Pueblo? Well, we're probably going to get that anyway. But I'm arguing that we are trustees of Colorado and its fragility, and that you do not want to have 16 million. Okay, we also have people wanting to ask questions on the top level, so we'll take that one next. And I want to 
let the technical person in the audience know that if a person does go on too long, in a, making a statement, not asking a question, you can go ahead and shut the mic off. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> My question was that, would you literally say that we're bad because we come over here to try to make money? Would you say that's a bad thing? For those who live in poverty to come over here and make money for their family, little children trying to get food in their stomach, would you blame them from trying to come over here and make money? Would you? I don't call anybody bad. I am saying it is a bad institution to allow illegal immigration. And I can't use your standard. I, I appreciate the, the heartfelt that you do. And I understand the emotion that comes behind this. But you know, I, I, you, you look around the world, and there's billions of people. There are three billion people that live like on $2 a day. And so they're hungry, too. They've got children, too. They would like to come here and, and, do, and, and, and be here, too. But I'm saying that the best thing that the United States can do in a global warming world is to run a sustainable society, so to, to stabilize our population, to start thinking about GDP, to start thinking about um, how we raise up our poor. That's my vision of, of where America should go. And it's not calling anybody bad. If, if the concern is truly a global warming or a global environmental problem, I don't see how shifting them on the globe from one country to the United States makes that problem worse. <laughs> and in fact, actually, since we do a better job of managing our resources here, that in lots of the spillover places in the third world where they have poor property rights system, it seems like it would improve it. Yeah. I, what you're doing is, in fact, you're assuming that, that all of those people could come to America and become consuming Americans, and they do. I appreciate that. If I lived in, 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 in another place, I'd probably try to sneak into the United States too. But your environmental impact and footprint of an average American, you know very well, is substantially more than other places where we're taking our immigrants. We can't, I don't believe, um, I really don't believe that immigration is a solution to the world's poor. I was named Humanist of the Year uh, 10 years ago because of the work I did in Cambodian uh, refugee relief. I care about it. I'm an internationalist. But, if you, but I think when you look at the kind of world poverty, how many, how many, uh, how, how many immigrants are we going to have to take to deal with this kind of, these kind of questions, world poverty? We could double immigration and double it again and double it again. There's 76 million new people every year, every year, every year coming in, mostly to the third world. Immigration is not the way to solve world poverty. Uh, actually, I agree with you that it won't solve the world's environmental problems to the extent they exist, and it won't solve world poverty. I'm just saying it's not going to make it any worse. In fact, it will be on the margin slightly better. Okay, next question. Hi, my name is Jessica Demshar, and I'm a member of Rights for All People and we are an immigrant rights group based here in Denver. Um, at Rights for All People, we believe that the immigration debate is actually an extension of the debate over minority rights, the rights of the poor, and the rights of women in this country, as well as other marginalized groups that struggle for equal recognition as citizens in this nation. From that perspective, especially over your land, if you could, in terms of national security, explain to me how our domestic <coughs> policies and practices to deter terrorism is not, in fact, an attack on our minority and immigrant, and immigrant populations, given the fact that each of the 9-11 hijackers entered this country legally, on legal visas, <laughs> and, that the, and that subsequent anti-terrorist policies, such as Operation Tamarack, have resulted in the deportation of both legal and illegal immigrants that are minorities and not terrorists. Fair, fair question. Um, uh, five. A lot of illegal immigration are people who come legally and then overstay their visas. Five of the 9-11 hijackers actually were in that category. They were not here legally. They, they have overstayed their visas. So under my plan, and the 9-11 commission plan, I dare say, is that we really have to have a way, if you're going to, and these are thoughtful people who look at our security needs, they said, look, we, we need a system to know who's legally in the United States. That isn't, the national security isn't an attack on minorities. If, if people are here, they've got their rights anyway. But, it, but, but what we're it's saying is, look, in a world that is filled with people and increasing all the time that really hate us, we got to have some control of who comes in here and who doesn't. That's, I just disagree with you that this is an attack on minorities. But if minorities are the ones being deported and not a single one of them has a link to terrorism, is there not a disconnect then in your plan to stop terrorism by targeting immigrants? 
But no, that's only one of the plans. But it's not the reason that people are deported. It's not only terrorism. People are deported because, uh, because for a number of reasons, uh, they commit crimes while they're here or some other reason. There's lots of reasons to deport people, not only on terrorism. I don't mean to say it's only on terrorism. Thank you. Okay. Were you going to come in on that one? No. Okay, we're going to go back up to the top level. Is there someone up there who wants to ask a question? Um, this is primarily an uh, address to Governor Lamb, but um, you know I have some bones to pick up, pick with Dr. Powell too. Uh, A, Dr. Lamb, as is usual, refuses to un uh, to acknowledge the ordinary facts of U.S. history. The first illegal immigrant was none other than Christopher Columbus whom we will be celebrating, to, to, to whom we have dedicated a state holiday, the first state in the Union to have dedicated a holiday to a mass murderer and, and to an imperialist. Number two, the political economy of the, I mean, Mr. Lamb touched upon the implications for, uh, for the world in terms of American consumption. Well, that's, that's interesting to hear you say that. What are we going to do about it, right? It, I mean, we have destroyed broad sectors of the Mexican economy with a nice free market mechanism called the North American Free Trade Economy. Uh, really. These, do, I mean, so it allows people like Walmart, it allows all of agri-businesses to flood Mexico with subsidized products while driving millions of Mexican families and businesses off the land and into bankruptcy. You, do you have an immigration problem? I think you would. Number two, when you talk about Remember this, a question. Yes. Number, number three, if you have to talk about, if you have to talk about security issues, maybe we should think about of the almost million people that were killed in U.S. wars to promote democracy in Central America in the 1980s, and that continued today in the Middle East. There is a massive refugee crisis in Iraq. Perhaps it's time we look at ourselves. Thank you. Is there well, a response? There's too many things on the table here in that question. I mean, many of them are good. And, and invite me back. I'll be happy to. Uh, because there's a great question. I don't support the war in Iraq and didn't from the very beginning. I think that there's many things that you said which were true. Let me talk about NAFTA though. Uh, you know, NAFTA, which I didn't have, a, I didn't have anything to do with NAFTA, but remember, the Mexican government wanted NAFTA desperately. And so the fact that NAFTA, NAFTA didn't work out the way that America thought it would or Mexico thought it would, but this wasn't imposed on Mexico, this was welcomed and sought by them. Yeah, I just dispute the notion. I mean, there's a lot of problems with NAFTA, I think, mostly because it's actually not a completely a free trade agreement. It's got a whole bunch of other stuff thrown in there, just like CAFTA that we passed last year. Uh, but the notion of cheaper products going to Mexico, when people are poor and they get cheaper products, that means their real income goes up. So actually, it seems pretty good. Uh, and because there's no limit on the number of things that people want, it doesn't have to on net destroy jobs either. OK, go ahead. Yes, uh, my name is Danielle Short, and I'm with the American Friends Service Committee. We have a project called Coloradans for Immigrant Rights, where we have people who are coming together to really talk about these issues, mostly citizens who are saying, our communities would actually be better if we found a way to um, address the immigrant rights issue and to provide human rights to all immigrants. And we have a lot of conversation about this issue, not just from the perspective of the rights and the human rights of the immigrants, but also how we can look at the issue of jobs for, for U.S. foreign workers. We care about both of those groups. And we've come to the conclusion that we can move forward the best as a society and um, improve the lot for all workers in this country by legalizing workers. One thing I haven't heard today so far is any conversation about um, the, the fact that the perceptions on the, on the side of many U.S. foreign workers that that um, their, their economic power, their buying power, their economic security has decreased over the last several de decades. I think that's the real issue. And um, you know, uh, buying power is down, healthcare is more, more expensive, pensions are more, are, are more difficult to access. 
And if we look at the issues around jobs and the role that immigration have taken in jobs, we see that there are other factors that can, in, in, in play which are making it more difficult for workers to defend their labor rights, which is what has actually brought labor, labor um, wages down. And then immigrants were brought in to take, to take those jobs after the wages were brought down. I'm wondering if you could comment on that issue. Yeah, so there's a whole bunch. Can I go first? Uh, there's a whole bunch in there, and in fact, I can't answer all of it because there was a whole bunch of tough economic questions overall in there. But a couple, I think, important points about this. One is, we're still not picking up any effective on net jobs disappearing from Americans when the workers come here. And really, the only thing we're getting any evidence of is those high school dropouts competing with low-skilled immigrants. And even that, it's not clear that it's a negative effect on their wages. Some people find positive, some people find slightly negative. So I don't see immigration as the driving cause on these other problems. But on top of that, though, the notion, though, that America is becoming poorer, here's the litmus test to ask yourself. What does the American, average American family have now compared to 1970 in terms of goods, services, and lifestyles that they have? We're much wealthier today, the average American for that matter. Take someone who's in official poverty in the United States today and actually compare the consumer goods that they own at the percentage rates that they do compared to the average family in 1970. The poorer people today actually have more than the average back then. So I'm skeptical of this whole, I, there are some statistics who could show different negative effects in different segments of the market, but I'm skeptical of the overall view that somehow your average or poor American has become worse off in the last 30 years. Yeah, and, and, and you, can I just clarify my question? I, I don't know if it's clear, I was not trying to say that I think immigrants oh. are the cause of that at all. I'm saying I think there's a, other um, issues that are not being debated, are not being addressed, and that immigrants are being scapegoated and are, keeping us from, from having these conversations of what the, the true issues and the real issues in our society that we need to be talking about are. Fair enough. Um, thank you for being with the American Friends Service Committee. It's a great, or, a great organization. and I appreciate your contributions to the dialogue. Um, I don't know what question that you, I thought you were going down the amnesty question and I don't know. I still think that when Paul Krugman and when all of these people that have looked at this problem have come to the same conclusion that this is hurting our own poor. The American Friends Service Committee, for all of its compassion, which is uh, immense, I think is really overlooking what it's doing to our own poor. Okay, back up at the top. I'm a Metro student, and I have one uh, real simple question. Why is it that this country brags about defending other people in other countries, and the people that come here seeking help we treat as criminals? I, I don't think, how do we treat them as criminals? I mean, I, I heard that at the beginning thing. Wait, because because that we don't give benefits to illegal immigrants doesn't mean we're criminalizing them. You, you, you don't have a right to, to benefits. You can't, you can't say, I live in Bangladesh and I have a right to uh, a social security check. Um, I think that you, uh, you know, America's got an incredibly passionate um, a compassionate uh, immigration policy. We take twice as many immigrants as almost the rest of the world combined. Um, we, d we, take we do incredible things on that. And I think it's really wrong to say, because we don't let everybody in, that that's a, not a compassionate immigration policy. You can't let everybody in. You shouldn't let everybody in. There is a poverty in the world, but our maximum immigration policy isn't going to dent that poverty. Okay. Yeah, in an empty, the country was built by immigrants. Is that the slogan? You really, is that the thoughtful way you want to address an immigration policy? Something that happened when we were an empty continent, Christopher Columbus came here, and that we should say the same thing? There's a new world, is what I'm arguing. Okay. Another question, you're going to comment? No? Okay. okay, we'll take the next question. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We were gonna, uh, we we're gonna go back to the bottom because there's a really long line down there. Then we'll come back up to you. Go ahead. Um, rectifying all these statements 
is it not possible that the rich getting richer are the cause of the poor getting poorer rather than poor immigrants making sure. other poor people poor? I, I mean, we have a you bet it is. extreme flight of cash to the top of our economy and not at the bottom. And I just have a real hard time believing that people making $20,000 a year are making anyone else poor. I didn't. Look, I didn't say immigration was the only reason. There's lots of problems in our society. We're talking about here, though. You I, I, know that that is the case. I understand. But let me tell you, all of these problems are complex. There's no one answer to any of them, okay? I mean, you're, you're right. If I seem to imply that the reason that people are getting richer is because of illegal immigrants, I don't mean so. But I'm saying illegal immigrant, pri immigrants primarily benefit their employer class. It's primarily, that's who they benefit. And that's what I think you're defending when you simply say we want to we want to turn our back on illegal on enforcing our illegal immigration laws. They don't primarily benefit employers. They primarily benefit those people who buy the products that they are they and their employers produce here in the United States. And the people who earn money in the United States, when they're not using the uh, visible hand of the government to get it are actually getting it by offering products and services to serve others. That's how you get richer, unless you're using the government to get somebody to transfer you their wealth or to restrict your competitors. That, again, is the trickle-down theory. The Austrian School of Economics, are actually, they've got a lot of good things to say. I really do think they have a lot of good things to say. But that's the attitude that, they're, that they really have, is that, you know, that's okay. Employers make a lot of money. Somehow it'll all work out. Folks, it isn't going to work out. If we left it to this kind of a philosophy, you wouldn't have wage and hour laws, you wouldn't have child labor laws, you wouldn't have women uh, pr protection laws of all kinds. Go With all ahead. due respect, Governor Lamb, if, if I offer you the opportunity to buy this pen for me for a dollar and you value the pen more than a dollar and you give me the dollar, by me providing you with a pen, I've made you better off. How have I made you worse off? That's not trickle down. That's me directly benefiting you and you directly benefiting me. That's the nature of voluntary exchange. It's the people who sell the pens, Dr. Powell. It's the secret of people who sell the pens that make the money. True. And it's the people who bought the pen who got the good that actually makes their life better. Okay, go ahead, back up at the top. If the land is free, then how come us immigrants can be free in America and achieve our goals and our dreams? I hope you can achieve your goals and achieve, achieve your, your dreams. And if you're an immigrant, you're not welcome to America. Please understand, we're talking about illegal immigration here, not, not, not immigration. Uh, and if you're an immigrant and you're in the, you're in the, the land of your dreams, what? You see, I'm not an immigrant. I'm legal. And you know what? I used to be in the game and all that stuff, but look at me right now. I changed because I'm going to do better. So why don't you don't give a chance to those people? My, my only answer is please try to imagine. Try to imagine that there's a waste paper basket here and it's filled with marbles. No, it's because you don't care. <laughs> Oh, you can tell that from me, huh? Well, let me tell you. You know, I, I formed and I founded and was the first vice president of the NAACP at the University of California. My first job out of law school was at the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Commission. Our family marched at Selma. Don't tell me I didn't care. I was being told again. to leave at a quarter till. So I'm going to try to get, if you can make your sec your question 10 seconds long, get through a couple of these folks who've been waiting down here. Go ahead. In the 90s, the nations around the world had a tremendous influx of immigration. In the United States, it was the biggest wave of immigration of the century. At the same time, those economies had a tremendous economic growth fueled by the, the increase, historic increase in property values. These same economies have seen a collapse in property values after a crackdown in immigration. Examples are Spain, France, and now the United States. An analysis of number of fluctuation by zip code, it ranks two areas in Colorado in the highest state, Montmelo and the area between Alameda and Pedro. These areas are highly populated by immigrants. <clears throat> Why a few economies only a few economies, such as Dr. Giovanni Perry from the University of Vegas, mentioned this correlation, and why the majority of economies don't mention this correlation. Are they biased? Thank you. 
I don't think they're biased. I, I think it's a mistake to talk about like the overall downturn in the housing market being caused by immigration reform. It does so happen that the two things were going on simultaneously, but it also happens that we were cracking down on immigration while housing prices were going way up. So, but that said, so I don't think it's the overall drive. It's certainly true that in particular localized markets where there is a high percentage of immigrants, if you crack down on the people who are demanding housing in that area and either move some out or prevent more from coming in, that'll dampen the housing market in any area. Uh, I think most economists would recognize it. They just don't find it particularly interesting to study, unfortunately, maybe. I agree. Okay, the next one. Okay, uh, my name is Helen Jerome Rushvik, and I teach a Mesoamerica class here at Metro. Uh, and I just want to make one comment about what happens if the Native Americans have the same immigration law. Uh, the other thing really going along with that is this ahistorical viewpoint, right, really does um, uh, contribute to these racial undertones. Uh, and then the questions, I have two of them. Um, first of all, is this issue of immigration, and I'm specifically directing this to Mr. Lamb, is that excusing the American responsibility to the world environment? And I want you to clarify that, because as human beings, we all have that responsibility to our mother. The other thing is, why is it, and this could be answered by both, why is there not regulations um, concerning the big businesses that go into Mexico? I really would like to know that answer. Um, the, why, don't, why don't you, you go ahead and let me, let me organize my thoughts. Okay, uh, I'll give you unorganized thoughts. Uh, <laughs> First, about the, uh, the historical aspect, actually. I think it's uh, a mistake when people say, and I'm not putting you in this context, so different people mean it different ways. When they talk about Columbus coming here, what if the Native Americans had the immigration policy of closed borders? Well, at least in the short run, the Native Americans probably would have been better off. But we have to be clear what type of immigration was coming on. There's a difference between an invasion and conquering and coming to a place where people voluntarily sell homes, rent to you, or hire you to work. Columbus wasn't doing the latter. He was showing up and saying, I'm going to stick you with a sword and enslave you. So I don't like equating the two and talking about it like that, because just because it would have been a better policy for the Native Americans doesn't mean it's a better policy for the Americans who live here today, because we're asking the immigrants to come here and interact on a voluntary basis, not to come with guns and shoot at us. Yeah, but my point there is that as human beings, we should learn to share the earth. That's my point. Yeah, if you would stop, um, if you would stop immigration, the earth would continue to warm, the environment would continue to uh, deteriorate. It's a really good point. It, 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 it's, a, it's mass consumption, it's consumption uh, and burning of oil and burning of other things that is the primary problem. You're right. Very quick question down here, go ahead. My name is Gilan, I'm working at Metro State College as an instructor. I'm teaching political systems and ideas. First, I want to tell you, both of you, you are here to unite us, to unite the citizens of US. You are speaking in the interest of the citizen of US. As I observed different countries, I came from Ethiopia through Moscow. During the fall of communism, I was there. There were different debates about immigrants, refugees. Still there are debates. But what I want to tell you is, when we are speaking about national interest, we have to take care and we have to think what happened on the question of nationality, especially in Germany, where millions of Jewish were, were deported and canceled and, and, and killed because of the national question. So here when we are discussing why, why I'm thinking of you, one of you is speaking about economy, the economical effect which is related with immigrants, and one of you are speaking about illegality or non-legals or illegal immigrants in the U.S. and so on. My question is, let me start from, from economy. As I worked with the refugees for more than three years, almost refugees and 
illegal immigrants who are crossing the border are paying. The poor Ethiopians, Somalians, who are crossing the border are paying at least 3,000 US dollars. So, my question is, when we are speaking about immigrants or illegal immigrants from Mexico to US and so on, do you think they are not paying? Do you think they are crossing the border without the knowledge of somebody who is working with the security forces? And what do you think about this type of economical effect to the families of these immigrants who is crossing by the support of the other forces who are working the authority? I hope and I know that without the knowledge of these forces, no one can cross the border. This is one question. So, the second one is... Okay. When you know what, sir? I'm sorry, we're out of time. So we're going to give them a quick chance to respond. I, Go ahead. I very much disagree with your statement about nationalism. It is, it's fascism, it's, it's, it's Nazism that killed the Jews. I, every country's got a nationalism. Every country. Japan feels very strongly. China feels very strongly. Ghana feels very strongly. People feel strongly about their nation, and they should. But you can, you can. Let me finish. Let me finish. I think we always have we'll always have room for refugees in this country. You're going to have to. Uh, yes, you can support or not support. That is a fact. When when the Germans decided to purify them, saying that we have to purify our nation, and they spoke by, by the name of the nation. This is Sir, this is the fact. But my second question. Let me come to the second question about illegal immigrants. What is the difficulty? for you and the representatives of the state to stop this. There are structures, there are political systems. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, I really disagree with the idea that the American government is deliberately winking at or facilitating the, of the crossing of illegal immigrants. I just think that's wrong. Okay. 